it's Dr. Sophie Duncan, who's our speaker. Um, she is a research fellow and a dean for welfare at Broadley College. Sophie writes about Shakespeare and gender, and she has a book called Searching for Julia, which is out in paperback. Sophie's um, been an advisor on uh, for theatre and TV, so a historical advisor, and I'm really, really looking forward to hearing what she's got to say. So, Sophie Duncan.
Like a lot of their contemporaries, Hunter Blair had a very poor opinion of academic standards of modern in the 1870s, which I'm pleased to say isn't the case anymore. Um, he wrote towards the end of his life of the northern academics who taught Hunter Blair and Wilde. And I suppose I don't know how it all come off in the memoirs of my students in half a century of time. But he, Hunter Blair said that the maudlin dons who taught himself and Wilde and Ward were the lilies of maudlin. They toiled not, neither did they spin. <laughs> <laughs> and Hunter Blair felt that he had a better education at Eton than he got at maudlin. Um, and he was part of what he fairly honestly described as a large contingent of Etonians like myself who had no particular incentive to work. Most of the people who were there in the world had a good opinion of the president at the time, Bully, as a kind of dignified, kindly, affable man with an excellent wife. It was a city full of cobbled streets and dim gas lamps. North Oxford was starting to be developed, which seems to have been seen as a very sort of feminised and feminine place where the wives were, compared to the masculine centre of the university. Cowley and Edwin Rose were not yet urbanised, and King Edward Street, which runs off the high street towards Oriel, my own college as an undergraduate, was brand new at the time, and there were anecdotes of Ruskin walking about it, like crying at how horrible he thought it was. To give you a little sketch of Wilde's time at Maudlin, he matriculated or joined the university in October 1874. He'd taken admissions exams that June, and he, he became what's called a Maudlin Demai, which is the name we give to our scholars. Um, we still have Demise, and it's one of the pleasures for the students is to know they've been admitted to the type of scholarship that Oscar Wilde had, because I should say he's, from the undergraduates, our most famous alumni of our alumni. And when I was a postdoc, I was Demise, it was a pleasure to me to kind of join that group. I'm afraid to say as a tutor, he has a rather checkered early academic career. We have collections at the start of each term at Maudlin where students are tested on their previous work and passed us really badly for a bit. He frequently fails to function as a kind of post admissions, admissions exam the first time he sets them, he sits them. But through 1875, his academic work steadily improves according to our college records. Then, in April 1876, Wilde's father, Sir William Wilde, died, and sort of six to eight weeks later, he begins Moss, his first set of exams, which are really grueling stuff. But nonetheless, his first class results are announced on the 5th of July, 1876. I just need to just a little bit of a worse sound, excuse me. Decides to remove 
commit half the time if he returns to the pile of work satisfactorily done in October. In October, while he comes back, he has not in fact done the work. <laughs> and they do find him, but that's it. And then, from then on, he does incredibly well. It's clear that he posed as a dilettante and, you know, full cozy, but he worked really hard. His philosophy notebook alone has 304 pages of quotations noted down in two years. And then come his files. And the world's rhapsody and satisfaction are such that there's one letter I love to show to our undergraduates, to his father and to Great Kings. He says, it is too delightful altogether, this display of fireworks at the end of my career. I cannot understand with my verse, except for the essays which I was fairly good in. The dons are astonished beyond words, the bad boy doing so well in the end. They make me stay up for the gaudy, make me, and said nice things about me. For his long poem in Ravenna, he wins the Newtip Prize, and his Oxford career ends on a slightly sour note because he unsuccessfully attempts to get the Trinity Classics Fellowship. Not getting fellowships in classics seems to be quite a good springboard for writers, actually, because somebody else who didn't get a classics fellowship but was also a modern man was C.S. Lewis. <laughs> so there's a proud history of people not getting jobs in classics and then doing something quite different. <laughs> and Wilde's career was exceptional in many respects. You know, the, the trouble, the poor food, the new to the prize, um, the myths that grow up around him, of which more later. But not actually the ups and downs and the vicissitudes, and that's something I'd like to tell our students. Um, his letter to William Ward, which is one of the ones we'll show in the exhibition, about his moderation, his mod results, swings from joy, beginning, My dear boy, I know you'll be glad to hear that I've got my first all right. And, of course, I knew I got it first. And so it swaggered horribly. Two, rather touchingly, my poor mother is in great delight, and I was overwhelmed with telegrams on Thursday from everyone I know. My father would have been so pleased about it. I think God has dealt very hardly with us. It has robbed me of any real pleasure in my first, and I have not sufficient faith in providence to believe it is all for the best. I know it is not. So many of our students of Portland have had difficult things happen to them on the way, and when they're with us since COVID particularly, because of the welfare, if something awful is happening to one of our undergraduates, I hope I know about it. But bereavement is difficult. I'm very much reminded of our students today when I read that letter. He also suffers from concealment of various kinds. Um, while well, lied about his age, constantly thought that he pretended to be younger than he was. But I'm also, I also know that even with William Ward, in whom he confided many things, when Oscar's half-brother, Henry Wilson, died in 1877. Wilde told everyone it was his cousin. He could not say it was his half-brother. More student characteristic things are his forays into fashion and his unusually long hair, which is a motif in every memoir that mentions him. J.C. Bodley described Wilde's sartorial experiments in Union Jack-like checks, his horsey neckties of the blue called bird's eye, his curly brimmed hat spouts on one ear, his tall collars and his short hair. One of the happiest times of his life at Oxford is mercifully documented for us by a highly unusual correspondent, a 16-year-old girl from Bristol, Florence Ward. Now, Florence Ward was the youngest sister of William Ward, Oscar's closest friend in London. Florence had been brought up on the strictest religious principles and was basically never allowed to do anything in Bristol. But then, in commemoration week, summer 1876, she comes with her mother and her sister Gertrude to visit her graduating brother William in Oxford to see the sights and attend her first ball. She is as excited and funny about it as you'd expect. She and Gertrude fall out a lot, they do each other's hair, Gertrude's too fat for her new dress, it all goes on, it's lovely. <laughs> and she seems to have been a great hit with Reginald Harding and his brother. Wilde was there for all of this visit, and he features in the diary as her big brother's best friend. The Ward family, Wilde and other friends, went together to Blenheim, to Radley School with the Ward family, where the Ward boys had gone and where Wilde's son Cyril would eventually end up. The diary, which you can see in the exhibition, is a hoot. Wilde gets the girls drunk on Moselle Cup, a 
a confection of sparkling wine, bitters, and in some recipes, brandy. Florence's elder sister Gertrude um, seems, <coughs> seems to have been rather an object of interest to the world. They have a bit of a flirtation in this week. Um, the world is described as becoming soony with her while walking around the gardens at Blenheim, and while loses his temper with the party when they become the object of gossip. William Ward's nickname was Bouncer with his northern friends because it was a children's book where there was a small little character called Bouncer and William Ward was not tall. And Ward writes about the family with this surname, telling Reginald Harding, I liked Mrs. Bouncer immensely, and the eldest Miss Bouncer is very charming indeed. Florence's diary reports her sightings of Oxford celebrities alongside Wilde, including Prince Leopold, who attended the same ball and danced with a member of their party. Florence says, and uh, Florence thinks Wilde is really glamorous and great. In comparison, Prince Leopold looks very uninteresting and stands with his head poked out and his mouth wide open. The prince is well known to Wilde and his friends. Hunter Blair recalls him as a rather pathetic figure in a long overcoat trimmed with fur. Leopold was at Christchurch, but regularly attended lectures and chapel at Magdalen, and was a special guest at Lady Magdalen. Hunter Blair was often deputed to play duets with him. Wilde's encounter with Prince Leopold, which we were talking at lunch about Wilde's anecdotes, this may be apocryphal, but it comes up a lot from people who would have been there. But one evening when Prince Leopold came to chapel, Wilde was deputed to read the lesson, wearing a surplice, and a typical Wilde in a surplice, and he began in a languorous voice the song of Solomon and was hastily corrected by Dean Brownley because he accidentally opened the wrong bit of the Bible. <laughs> when not in college, Leopold and Wilde belonged to the same Masonic lodge. It will not perhaps surprise my listeners to hear that Wilde spent prolifically as a student. The Barclays ledgers for the bank in Oxford revealed spending at his tailor, at Osmond to the jewellers, at Spears' Emporium. He was buying plain cups, coffee cups, ornaments, and of course, decorative china. He spent £40 in three months in 1875 on Masonic regalia. His scholarship from Morden was about £90 a year. And his parents paid him about £1,500 across the entire degree. So £40 in three months is going it. From 1877, he was also paying membership fees for London Club. He was also perennially in debt for small, 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 small sums to his friends, including Ward. During his time in college, Wilde walked, as he would recall, from prison as a result of the back of our menus, more than his narrow bird haunted walks. He spent time in London seeing Henry Irving out. He went on trips to follow his uncle John Maxwell on Wilde, who was a vicar in Lincolnshire. They did not get on at all. And he spent the holidays often hunting, fishing, and trying often letters to persuade Ward to come and join him. He lived in different sets of rooms around college. I'm sorry we can't see our way to the Oscar Wilde room. I have to say, apart from that, I don't think he ever had a decent set of rooms apart from the Oscar Wilde room. He spent one year in what's now the JCR dining room, very dark, and was a set in Chapman's Squad, which is still a super room, and I have to say I find it massively depressing. So no wonder he was glad to get into the very lovely um, Oscar Wilde room as it is today. And there were, of course, his travels across Europe that got him into such travel trouble. These uh, letters won't be in the exhibition, but what is very lovely, and I think you can say, is that. Um, we now have the letters of William Ward, which uh -huh. haven't been shown publicly, about that trip, and which um, kind of sheds a new light on it. A big point in world biography is this audience that he has with um, Pope Pius IX in the trip to Rome. But when you read <coughs> William Ward's letters, it turns out, basically, if you were a Mordlin man in Rome, you could see the Pope on about three days' notice. It was very easily arranged, which I do find interesting. And Ward's narrative of visiting the Pope is a much less dramatic version, quite a vigorous, jolly Pope Pius, rather than the kind of romantic, mystical figure of Wilde saw. We're lucky in a lot of our we, we have images of him from this time alongside his friends, alongside his brother William, and they all reflect 
David comes to Blair, described as bullhoppy, good humour, unusual capacity for pleasant talk, and Irish hospitality exercised much beyond his pleasant means. He was developing it up as a writer. While looking back on his time at Warden as one of lyrical ardour and of studious, solid writing. The internal evidence of the Sphinx poem suggests he began with Wild and Warden and will be shown in the first edition as part of the exhibition. As well as Warden Walks, there's the sonnet he wrote after hearing Dias Ire in Warden Chapel, later revised to kind of upgrade it to be after hearing it in the Sistine Chapel, but it's a little more than just classic world. And we find Maudlin's influence in his later writings too, which we'll be sharing in the exhibition. So with the critic as artist, when he laments that he can imagine the smile that would illuminate the glossy face of the Philistine, if one ventured to suggest to him that the true aim of education was the love of beauty, and that the methods by which education should work were the development of temperament, the cultivation of taste, and the creation of the critical spirit, but he reflects that, yet, even for us, there is left some loveliness of environment. And the dullness of tutors and professors matters very little when one can loiter in the grey cloisters of Maudlin and listen to some flute-like voice singing in Wayne Chapel, or lie in the green meadow among the strange snake-spotted fritillaries and watch the sunburned news smite to a finer gold the towers filled in veins. He was willing to sneak a reference or a compliment to Maudlin into his journalism too. Returning to Oxford in 1885 to review hours as Henry IV, he criticised the university's new use of vivisection and the architecture of People College, but said that like art finds her home by the artist as she once did by the Elizabeth, the Maudlin walks and the Maudlin cloisters are as dear to her as whatever the silver olives of Columbus the golden gateways of the house of the palace. Our exhibition, Wild is Wild, opens on the 16th of October, Wild's 170th birthday. And if you're available, we'd love to see you back. We have a special service at Evensong in the chapel at 6 to celebrate Wild's life and work. And part of the pleasures of this summer have been discussing with our chaplain and our informant of Coristorum music and readings we might choose. We also draw on memories of the world by his friends and acquaintances, um, but above all on his letters to William Ward. As I said, his letters to Ward are really the story of his time of Oxford. Towards the end, there are again ups and downs. He says, I am reading hard for a fall in grace, how the mighty fallen. But ultimately, when he does get his double verse, he writes, my dear old boy, you are the best of fellows, the telegraph of congratulations, and the one that I value more. And some of the things we find out from his letters to Ward, um, he was a doodler, well, there's an inveterate doodler, which you've seen any manuscript of his will know, but we see teapots, faces, animals, all kinds of marginalia, made up saints' days, and different flourishes of signature. He was a generous friend. He did borrow his friend, but he was immensely generous in his gift of a gold ring with Reginald Harding to Ward at Christmas 1876, after Ward left. His letters to Ward are full of complaints that Ward isn't writing back, although I don't think I've ever looked at a, a young writer's letters and not found the full of complaints that the other person is writing back as much as they like. I think, you know, for, for authors in embryo, they tend to find everybody a tiny correspondent. But after Ward leaves Maudlin and as he predicted settles down to be a bloodless solicitor at Bristol, they do see less and less of each other, and it's obviously a source of great sadness on the world side. Wild inherited Ward's rooms, today's source of the world room, where he was living when he wrote Ravenna and Ward and Walks. And it is a letter from Wild to Ward that gives us the most complete picture of Wild's rooms as he lived in them. He wrote to William Ward, I enjoy your rooms awfully. The inner room is filled with china, pictures, a portfolio and a piano, and a grey carpet with stained floor. The whole get-up is much admired, and a little made fun, on Sunday evenings. The rooms are more delightful than I ever expected. The sunshine, the pouring rooks, and waving tree branches and the breeze at the window are 
are too charming. I do nothing but write sonnets and scribble poetry. Other friends have a different memory of the rooms, which does include the fact that if you went into the world's bedroom, which was sort of the innermost room of three, it was incredibly stuffy. There were papers and books absolutely everywhere, and the world was often to be found doing its work in bed. But one of the things um, that's very touching about this relationship is the, <coughs> is the very generous memoir, But Old World, by Ward, which is appended to Vivian Holland's work, Son of Lost World. Ward became, as he predicted, a blameless lawyer at Bristol, becoming a partner in the family firm. And actually, William Ward's great great granddaughter is also a lawyer, and it's about the 11th generation of lawyers in that family. So, very well into the law. Um, he, to give you a kind of an idea of what happens to him in parallel with Wilde, he marries in 1886. Like Wilde, he loses a son in the First World War. And Ward, at the end of his life, in his obituary, is noted for a simple goodness of character, brilliant intellectual gifts, an integrity of purpose coupled with a marked degree of ability. His was not the gift of public oratory, but he will remember, be remembered as, as persistently self-effacing, with a, pretend, a penetrating understanding, a persuasive cogency, and a supreme sense of justice. And I think these scholars explain, you know, Wilde's deep affection for him. On Ward's side, I think there's something in it of the devotion of a Watson to a Holmes, when Ward, as an older man, writes of Wilde as he knew him of the charm of his companionship and conversation, a laughing but always an interesting personality. How brilliant and radiant Wilde could be, how playful and charming, how his moods varied and how he reveled in consistency. The will of the moment he openly acknowledged as his dictator. There was the love of pose, the desire for self-realisation of the egotism, but they seemed foibles rather than faults. And his frank regret or love for his own expense robbed them of blame. Getty to the Ward family has been one of the pleasures of this exhibition, as has getting to the collectors and their collections and how exciting and rewarding that's been. We're able also to display several items from Al Albert Douglas, also a Lord and Man, slightly later. Um, there's also been surprises, including so a few weeks ago, um, the president of Northern, Diana Rose and I were hunting about in literally a small gloomy corner cupboard in the president's lodgings. Diana said, wouldn't it be funny if we found the world first edition in here? And about 30 seconds later, we did. We found the first edition of the course of the analysts that had never been catalogued, but was nice than the other ones so that will be going on display. It more than it seems to still have many world secrets to yield up, but it's a great fun getting to know some of them. One of the other um, publications about world knowledge, which we found while searching the exhibition, was a travel guide from 1910 published by all people Mills and Booth. So, the yeah, Mills and Booth's early 20th century did these travel guides. It's called the Romance of Oxford, and it sort of tells ghost stories and legends and celebrity stories from around Oxford. And one of the things it says about Maudlin is it, it talks a little bit in quite euphemistic terms about Wilde. But it says, of course, they are not proud of him. <coughs> and that attitude, I'm sad to say, existed in the 1920s when we refused what should have been an unmissable opportunity to acquire what is now the Robbie Ross collection. And sort of through the 40s and 50s, there were some unpleasant bits and pieces from students who had Wilde's lovely rooms and thought they might see his ghost and that that would, you know, be a terrible and sinful experience. But now, of course, we could not be proud of Wilde, and it is such a delight to be looking forward to his 170th birthday and 150th anniversary in college. I hope you will all come to the exhibition. There will be a programme of events alongside it on Wilde and duration, on Wilde's status as it is today, and some more to be announced. The ring will be on display, as you know, we saw the promise we got back. It will be, there's been lots of conversations about how to display it safely, and there's obviously an earnest space plan about to lose the ring once and to lose the ring twice and so on. <laughs> but that's not going to happen. Um, I very much hope you will have a chance to see our exhibition. I'm delighted to take questions.
Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very, very much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to ask you to clap again because that wasn't anywhere near enthusiastic enough. So please join with me. Seth has uh, uh, agreed to uh, take some questions. Um, uh, always in situations like this, uh, volume can be a, a bit of an issue. So uh, I'm here to provide additional volume, if necessary, uh, to the question. But uh, if you'd like to make yourselves known, um, then we can uh, uh, start to... Uh, uh... So how long would be the exhibition plan from the middle of October? The exhibition will run from the 16th of October to the 16th-ish of April. So we've got six months. It's primarily open on Wednesday afternoons, but we've been talking over last week, and we hope that will be a special, or maybe even two, society visits. Yes. Yes. Oh, no, th thank you very much. That was, that was really fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in Oscar Wilde's Masonic career, mm -hmm. and um, you said that um, he was in a Masonic lodge here uh, in, in Oxford. Could you tell me more about that? Was that the first time he became a Freemason? Was he initiated into Freemasonry here? As far as we know, yes, and he was um, slightly arranged for a special arrangement ring. He seems to become a member of two at one point, but the one he's really associated with is the Apollo Lodge, <coughs> which um, Prince Leopold is also in, as was Ward. So when, um, when Florence Ward's little sister is here, she describes them in their regalia, which she thinks is very glamorous and gorgeous, and Not everyone seems to have gone into the terrible short haircut he has at one point. Um, 
but certainly the spectators or even the choir, for example, the kind of um, adult academical class in the choir of the world of Harrod, they were, a lot of them are going in for this sort of cut. And I'm sure it is part of the world's influence, but also the student passion at the time when he becomes a very prominent student. Someone like Chris Leopold is much more conservatively dressed. Do you have any others, or are you done? Right. Well, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Dr. Sophie Duncan for coming along, and uh, we hope you have a rest, uh, a wonderful rest of day, and we'd like you to uh, accept oh, this on behalf of our. <laughs>